Hi, I'm Carol Pope, and you're listening to The Stewie Tunes Show with Tony Stewart and Aaron Badgley. Hey, Aaron, do you like riddles? I do indeed. Okay, riddle me this. What has four arms, four legs, and should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I'm stumped. Well, you know what? I think you know the answer to this one. (laughs) Tina Turner and Carol King. (laughs) Yes, Tina Turner and Carol King. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Why have you not inducted these ladies yet? I agree. We've got a great show tonight. We are going to be talking about Carol King and the 50th anniversary of Tapestry. You ready to get at it? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. I'll cue up the theme music and we'll be back in a minute. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Stewie Tunes Show. Show. These are insights and commentary on the music and musicians that shape our lives. And now, let's go back to class with your hosts, Tony Stewart and Aaron Badgley. Good evening, Mr. Badgley. So, uh, you got a little dumping of snow in Toronto, I see. Yes, Mr. Stewart, we sure did. Um... A lot of snow for Toronto, but uh, I'm proud, proud to say that we did not call in the, uh, the armed forces, the military. So yet again, the streak continues. Hey, we're on a good one. We're on a good one. Yeah, no, it's a lot of snow. It came down overnight, and uh, I shoveled in the morning, and there was a, a heap of pile there. But yeah, that's not. It, I, I, I put on, I put on Christmas music. <laughs> <laughs> You know who's oh, well. probably not playing Christmas music right now are those poor folks down in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. is, uh, I can't imagine what they must be thinking because that is non-Texas weather and they're just not prepared for it in any way, shape or form. No. And, it, and, and I was watching on the newscast and all the trucks sliding around and that dealing with the icy roads is even, you know, incredible, right? And if it's anything like my in-laws place in Florida, like they don't even have a furnace. Some of the homes Seriously? down there, yeah. Well, you know what? That's true. My daughter lived in Savannah, Georgia. They didn't have a furnace. They they didn't have a basement either, but they didn't have a furnace, so they just had AC outside. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so our thoughts are with you if you're listening down in Texas, but man, that is something else. Yeah, let's keep warm, guys, and stay off the roads. That's my advice. Well, we've got a, a great episode tonight. Uh, we are going to be talking about Carol King, and it's recently... As you posted on Facebook, uh, it's the 50th anniversary of Tapestry. And I know people have been celebrating it all over the place, but that is incredible. 50 years. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can remember my brother, Kurt, because I'm the youngest of five boys. I remember the, he, he, he bought the album at Simpson Sears, brought it home. And man, that just stayed on our old Fleetwood for a good week. I mean, for the whole summer, actually. But Oh, that's what we listened to for the first week was just tapestry over and over again. I remember it vividly, and um, yeah, and grew up with Carol King. I mean, she he bought all of her albums after that, so we listened to Carol King all my life. So there you go. Yeah, my first exposure to Carol King because, as you know, I was just a wee lad when uh, tapestry. <laughs> you were too, Tony. I, I know. was too. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't hear Carol King uh, for the first time until I. Like any of the songs from Tapestry, I would have been in high school and in high school band. We played a medley mm-hmm. of songs from Tapestry and that led me on a search for that album because I loved the music and uh, fell in love with Carol King's music ever since. But and that, but that's based on the album that you were, you were probably, those would be the 80s, late 80s that you were in high school, right? Well, I started, yeah, like I graduated high school 88. Okay, so here you are in the 80s listening to an album that at that time was already over 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And it still stood up to you, right? I mean, that's the thing about Tapestry. The album doesn't sound old. I put it on the other day. It still sounds fresh. It still sounds new. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I was listening to it the other day, too, and it's uh, it's still, it's brilliant. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Let's talk about Carol a little bit, shall we? So she of course, is known for her songwriting partnership with Jerry Coffin. But she married Jerry when she was 17 years old, which is incredible in and of itself. I mean, I guess it wasn't so unusual back then, but then started having hits as a songwriting team almost right away. Do you remember when you were 17? Because I I do. I I was an idiot when I was 17. I I still am, but I was more so of an idiot at 17. (laughs) I don't think you're an idiot. But. Oh, thank you, Tony. Thank you. Now, apparently, neither does my wife. There you go. Hi, Andrea. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, um, it's, uh, 
17, I can't even imagine. Because to me, you're still a kid. You yeah. have kids, right? I mean, can you picture your, your 17-year-old's married? No. And, you know, uh, Cynthia's mom was, was young when... So when Cynthia and I got married, her mom was just turning 39. Are you serious? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that, that goes to show you, right? Yeah, my mom was 16 when she got married, so... I had yeah. five boys, and that aged her remarkably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had three boys in my family, and uh, oh, I, we drove my mother crazy. We still do, I think. <laughs> oh, I love it. But yeah, Carol King, 17. With, and I tell you, uh, that, that, that songwriting partnership um, influenced a lot of people, including our own John and Paul from the Beatles. Yes. So I, I got a question for you before we go on. I, Oh, no, we'll talk about, I was just going to talk about the album Tapestry, but we'll keep going, because I was going to ask you what your favorite song is on the album. Well, yeah. Do you want me to tell you my favorite song now? Sure. Let's let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Sure. Um, I have a few. Uh, I love her version of uh, Will, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow, the way that she slows that down. That is so uh, poignant. And uh, what about you? I think my favorite's Tapestry. I always... You know, I, I like the imagery in the song, and and I love her voice in that song. To me, that's her best vocal of all time. And um, I and I just want to say, when you talk about slowing the song down, it changes the whole feel of the song, right? Yeah, it absolutely does. And and I'm going to just share this with everybody. I Tony very graciously let me hear a, a version he did of "If I Fell" by the Beatles, and Tony slowed it down. He did it on the piano, and I'm going to tell you, man, that was beautiful. Oh, and thank it you. Just changed the whole tone of the song and you know i'm not big on co covers of beatles songs so that this is a high compliment to you my friend oh thank you sir i appreciate <laughs> that but uh yeah it does it, it just makes it a little more poignant it almost gives the lyrics a slightly new definition as well yeah and especially for her version will you will you love me tomorrow is one of my highlights on that album i really like smack water jack too yeah well you, you know what go, go through this do you have it up there tony Can you tell i us do just, let me just pull just, it up yeah yeah run it run, like just remind people what's on this album because this is not an album with one hit wonder. We're talking about every song's a cracker, right? Oh well, yeah. I mean, most artists would give their eye teeth to write one of these songs. And, exactly. Yeah. So here we go. Side one. This is, uh, I feel the earth move so far away. Gorgeous. It's too late. Home again, beautiful and way over yonder. So incredible side one. And you flip the record over side two. You've got a friend where you lead. Will you love me tomorrow? Which of course was the originally made uh, a hit by the Shirelles smack water, Jack tapestry. And you make me feel like a natural woman, which Aretha Franklin had done. And then, so Carol was covering her own song, but incredible. Well, I mean, I mean, Aretha Franklin made it her own, right? Yes. You know, speaking of Aretha, I mean, I, we're going to do quite a few sidebars, I'm sure. But the Kennedy Center, the Kennedy Center honors when they honored yeah. Carol King. Did you see Aretha's performance? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, that was amazing. You know, she comes on in the big fur coat, and and it's a, Aretha Franklin. And as soon as she opens her mouth, I mean, everybody in that building, and she was 73 at that performance. Um, everybody in that building just falls in love with her as soon as she opens her mouth. And Carol King's reaction, because she she had no idea, right? No, it's a beautiful moment, you know, and, the, you, and, and it's a beautiful cover. It's a beautiful tribute to it. So it's a, I mean, how do you top that, right? Yeah, no, that was good. I enjoyed that very much. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of how you top that, let's segue into our next point is 1971, the amount of competition that album had, and yet, <laughs> and yet it, it emerges on top. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to name some albums that came out in 1971 in no particular order. Sticky Fingers by the Rolling Stones. Who's Next by the Who. Aqualung, Jethro Tull, one of my all-time favorites. Mm -hmm. Blue, Joni Mitchell, her best album for, for many people. Led Zeppelin Four with Stairway to Heaven. L.A. Woman by The Doors. Every Picture Tells a Story by uh, Rod Stewart, which had Maggie May. Hunky Dory by Bowie. What's Going On by Marvin Gaye. Yeah. Imagine by John Lennon. Ram by Paul and Linda McCartney. More on that later. And um, I mean, she, she managed to top them all. I mean... With an album by someone, you mentioned that she was writing with Jerry Goffin, right? Mm -hmm. So here's this person who's known for writing pop hits for people at the Brill Building, making a very serious album. Yeah, and you know what stands out for me? Uh, you know, reading the story behind her, she when she 
uh, divorced uh, Jerry in 1968, and then she moved out to Los Angeles, moved from New York to Los Angeles with two young kids in tow. The whole story is so unlikely for this album. You know, uh, when you look at what was going on musically, um, she not only opened the door for female singer-songwriters, I mean, she kicked it down, took a few names along the way. It was uh, (laughs) unbelievable. And and yet everything about the album, uh, it, it was almost counterintuitive that it, that it should be that popular, even though it is brilliant. But And, and, and it was her third album. Mm-hmm. I mean, she had, she had done an album with a band called The City. They kind of disbanded. She did a solo album. Neither were particularly, well, The City didn't even make the top 200. How about that? Mm-hmm. And, um, but I'm going to sidebar now because this is what, this is the difference in music then and now. A and M Records let her have the flops because they knew they had a good artist. So yes. she was three, four albums in. If she was a new artist today and got signed by a major label and put out an album that didn't make the top two hundred, she would be dropped like that. You yeah, know? not a chance of sticking around. No, which, no, <clears throat> no. A record so, companies hung on to artists then, you know. Yeah, so good on them. And uh, just, just amazing. The tapestry, uh, you know, kind of floated above those other ones, and. Uh, like you say, it's timeless. And some of the personnel, our next point here, some of the personnel on that album, you know, James Taylor was on there, Joni Mitchell. Mm-hmm. And yeah, Blue is a fantastic album. Gosh. Danny, oh, Blue. <laughs> we got to do I mean, an episode on Joni at some point too. Cause. I, I, I love Joni Mitchell. I, I never used to. I, my wife really opened my eyes and ears to Joni Mitchell. I liked her before, but now I'm a big fan. Um but uh, Danny Kuchmar on guitar, who still plays with Carol King, mm-hmm. and and Mary Clayton, who did vocals on the album, who was famous for her vocals on the Rolling Stones' uh, "Gimme Shelter," um, who, by the way, Tony, this is interesting. Mary Clayton is still alive and well, and she's just putting out a new album next uh, about two weeks. Oh wow! I'm very, yeah, I'm very excited to hear that. And there's a guy named Hank Cicillo who engineered the album, and I was very lucky to have a chat with him about an, about about George Harrison, to be honest, for another project I'm working on. And we talked about Tapestry, and he talked about Carol King playing this piano in the studio at A&M Studios. And he just felt like, he, you could, he said you could just release everything she did, like the, the music, the vocals. He, he was very fortunate to be part of that. But it was, that's, yeah, what a, what a cast. And, yes. and, you know, and, and that led to a friendship with her and James Taylor. Yeah, who did that, some brilliant um, stuff together. Well, the, you, you just saw that concert they did at the Troubadour. Yeah, that was great. Right, and that made top ten. That was a big album and a big concert. I mean, that, well, first of all, the Troubadour Club is is a historic landmark, right? Mm-hmm. Hendrix, Janis Joplin, all these people started there. But but that concert with him and uh, James Taylor and Joan, and um, I was going to say Joan Mitchell, James Taylor and and Carol King is just phenomenal. I think. It's yeah, great. I can too. watch it over and over again. It's yeah, very same good. here. And uh, before we go to break, you know, one more point is, you know, we've been talking that Carol King's music sticks around too. And of course, uh, I don't know if Andrea was a fan of the show, but Cynthia was a huge Gilmore Girls fan. <laughs> and uh, Where You Lead was used as the theme song for the Gilmore Girls. So it had a resurgence. And that was what, in the 90s, wasn't that it? That was in the 90s, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, of course, Andrea, you know, she dug it. And I think she liked it because Carol King did, because Andrew's a big Carol King fan. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, very funny. See, it, it that's the, to me that's the Carol King wasn't trying to be a hippie or jump any bandwagons in '71. She was doing what she wanted to do. Yep. Yeah. So and, it's timeless. Exactly. And when she moved to Laurel Canyon with her two kids in tow, I mean. Odds were certainly against her because she was known as a songwriter and, and uh, had the audacity to, to become a performer, which incredible. Yeah. And what a performer. I, um, I just watched recently her concert at Hyde Park, Hyde Park in London. Mm-hmm. She just, she just doesn't have to do anything. It's just her, her whole persona on stage is wonderful, you know? Sure is. Well, sir, shall we take a break and I'll go to the music history moment? Why not? Okay. <laughs> So we will be back in a moment. We're going to go back in time to February 20th, 1980, when ACDC singer Bon Scott was pronounced dead on arrival at a London hospital after a heavy night of drinking. Scott was found in the passenger seat of a friend's parked car. The official report stated that he had drunk himself to death. 
and any fans of Spinal Tap will get this reference. The coroner's report said that he suffocated on his own vomit. And now, let's get back to the show. You know, that's uh, that's an incredible uh, music history moment, Tony. It was, it's a tragedy. But what I find interesting is that this is a band that had more success post their original lead singer. Mm-hmm. So they brought Brian Johnson in. And from 1980 on, they had their biggest albums. Back in Black, For Those About to Rock, We Salute You, were much, much, much bigger albums than, than their biggest album with Bon Scott, which was Highway to Hell, um, which I've driven several times. Uh, it's called the DVP, folks. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're kidding. I've been on that highway. That's awful. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I just thought that was interesting that uh, uh, the band continued on without him to, to even bigger bigger success after uh, the tragic loss. And he was a great vocalist. But anyways, I just wanted to add that in. Yeah, and and certainly a lot of bands who lose a member, well, look what happened to Zeppelin, right? I mean, right. lose exactly. a member and, and that's it. Or Queen. Yeah. I mean, who could replace Freddie Mercury, right? And yeah. I know they've got, what's his name? Uh, Adam Lambert. Right, but he's not. they're not writing new stuff. They're not doing new music. They're just doing Queen hits redone, right? Well, that's right. Yeah. So Tapestry, of course, uh, launched into the stratosphere and launched what turned out to be an incredible solo career and other number one albums. Well, yeah, she had an album called Music, which was number one, Rhymes and Reasons, Fantasy. You must love the song Jazz Man, right? Yes. Right, that was a number one single. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm going to digress for a second again, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I I can't speak for Ottawa, I'm going to talk about Toronto Radio. But we have these stations here that play the hits of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I never hear Jasmine on the radio or her other hits that she had from from albums like, like Wrap Around Joy made number one in 1974. And she had hits off that album, right? I mean, she, she had some solid hits, like, like well, Jasmine was a hit. And then you had things like, um, you know, Corazon and, you know, Sweet Seasons. I just think it's a shame because these are great songs that are not being played and they should be. And, and, and I don't even hear tapestry here, Tony, to be honest with you, but yeah, I don't hear uh, her stuff. Well, we were saying the same thing about Tina Turner now too on radio. Yeah. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. And both should be in the rock and roll hall of fame. If you're listening, that's right. Same. Put them in this year. <laughs> they are long overdue. So, long overdue. So Carol King altogether, 25 solo albums that, that astounds me as well. Yeah, um, besides Tapestry, I love her album, Really Rosie, which was a kid's show, cartoon. And I, I bought that for my kids when they were little, the, the CD. I still, I listen to it now after they've long grown up, you know? I've never heard it, actually. I didn't know that she had done kids' music. Well, it's, it, when you listen, I listen to it now, it's not really kids' music. But okay. It's, it's, check it out, it's called Really Rosie, and it's, but 25 albums, again, and they were big albums. We're not talking about, you know... Anyways, but yeah, she stop. <laughs> she never cashed it in. That's for sure. I mean, just yeah. so prolific as a songwriter. Yeah, she did. She did a good Christmas album too. For those of you who like Christmas albums, I do, and she did a nice Christmas album. So, and you know, we had mentioned this earlier on in the show, but Tapestry, of course, the record label label um, Tapestry was her second solo album. The That's first right. one was called Writer, wasn't it? Yep. And and it yeah. and didn't crack the two hundred. A top 200 at all. No, no, that one did, but the one before, oh, okay. it, when she was in a band called um, The City. That That's did right. Crack the top 200, yeah. No, Ryder didn't do well, though. I mean, no. it wasn't a big album. It wasn't a big album, but by any stretch of the imagination, no. And then Tapestry, of course, has, still has so many records, either still holding on to them or ones that it set that were eventually overtaken, but the most consecutive weeks at number one. Amazing, isn't it? I yeah. mean, it's just when you when you look at that, and folks, stick around for my six degrees of Beatlemania. <laughs> I am sure you've got a good one there, but <laughs> again, you know, every to me, everything about this album, when you look at what was happening in 1971 in the landscape, uh, it was just such an unlikely story, and how it how it exploded like that, and and even. You know, there's nothing, it's just Carol on the cover, sitting there holding a tapestry that she was working on herself and her cat. 
<laughs> it, That's it, right, the cat. Let's not is, forget the cat. Right, yeah. the most nondescript album cover. Like everything about this thing. It and I, you know, what I like about that time period, Aaron, is is I like the fact that all these people could play. You know, they weren't just singing karaoke like a lot of people do now. That's just me being a grumpy old man. But I, you know, the fact that these people had chops and they could play. Well, I, I agree with you. I mean, I put her in the same category as like Cat Stevens or Joni Mitchell or Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young or mm-hmm. Jackson Brown or Billy, Billy Joel, who we talked about already, or the solo Beatles, Beatles. I mean, these, these are musicians That's playing right. real instruments as opposed to... Uh, and again, I'm going to sound like a grumpy old man here, but you know, having people write a song for you, record the track, you go into a studio, throw your vocals on it, auto tune it, and throw it out in the marketplace. Not the same. Not the same at all. No, I agree. And so, to me, uh, uh, well, uh, that was a golden age of uh, of rock and roll. I think it was just a wonderful period. I, I agree. The whole singer songwriter. But do you remember? Um, I tell you another artist. I, I mean, I, I'm not taking away from Carol King, but you don't hear Jim Croce's name thrown around oh, much anymore. Do I love Jim, Jim Croce. Croce. I, uh, can I tell you? Can I do a sidebar here, Aaron? Of course. Okay. This is a Jim Croce story. This is this is when I knew that I wanted to be a musician. And I and you talk to musicians, and you know this. Almost all of us, we can go back and say, "Oh, that was the moment." I was in grade four. Okay. Mm-hmm. At St. Joseph's Elementary School in North Bay. I grew up in North Bay, Ontario. Sitting in the gym in grade four, about two thirds of the way back on the right hand side near the end of the row. I still remember it like it was yesterday. And we had an, a middle school band come and play Bad Bad Leroy Brown. And I don't even remember if it was a good performance <laughs> or not, but that, that was it for me. Like I, I remember that moment like light, like lightning struck me. Was and that was the moment I, mean, I, I got to be a musician, and uh, it was, was uh, St. Mary's Middle School coming by and playing playing Bad Bad Leroy Brown. I love that. Yeah. I love that story. That's great. but it, I guess that is true for musicians, right? There's that epiphany moment where they hear something and it triggers that internal response that I need to play music, right? But you're right, and yeah, and Jim Croce, another one, right? The the singer songwriter model. I, I, we, this, uh, this past weekend, because it was snowing, folks, so we stayed in, because we're supposed to stay in, but also it's snowing. We dug out old John Denver albums. Oh, and, I, uh, John Denver's great, too. Love that yeah, guy. And, and Harry Nielsen. Mm-hmm. All those guys. They were just fantastic singers, musicians, writers. Yeah, well, golden age, right? So I agree. I well, agree. this looks like a great time for another break. And uh, we have been having some tech gremlin issues tonight folks so we are going to take the break because then we've got this set captured so i'm going to go on to the birthdays and we'll be right back here are your birthdays for february 20th first off in 1941 buffy saint marie the canadian singer songwriter who had the 1971 uk number seven single soldier blue She wrote Up Where We Belong, which was a massive hit in 1982, and that was featuring Joe Cocker and Jennifer Warnes. Next up, Jay Giles was born in 1946. He, of course, was with the Jay Giles Band. And finally, Kurt Covain with Nirvana was born in 1967. Let's get back to the show. And we're back, and we've got a couple more things about... uh, Carol King, and then we're going to do our get off my lawn moment. We've got a good one tonight. We were both talking about how annoyed we get at this. And um, I, I have to say one thing, Tony, about birthdays. Okay, sure. You did a great segment on the birthdays, but on the weekend, last weekend, February 14th, Valentine's Day, my niece had a baby. So I'm, I have a grandniece, and I'm very proud of that. So, yes, congratulations. So, hi to Naya and uh, Megan. So, yeah, just wanted to just say. You know, we're talking birthdays. I got to throw in about my beautiful niece. Well, and you know <laughs> what? We have a we have a cool coincidence. I got to yes, mention I, this because yeah, go ahead, your go ahead. it was Linda, right? Your daughter Linda. Yes. Yeah, yes, your yes. daughter Linda was yeah. born on February thirteenth. My right. son John, my youngest, was born on February thirteenth, and they're both twenty two years old. We just found that, that out. <laughs> That's a great coincidence. <laughs> what a bizarre coincidence of all the things. <laughs> happy birthday to John. Yes, you know? happy birthday to Linda. And- <laughs> I, that's such. I, when you told me that, I was just laughed. I thought, yeah, of course we're meant to work together and be and be friends. <laughs> you know, that's funny, eh? It but, is. 
So here is uh, an example of Carol King's greatness as a songwriter early on when her and Jerry Coffin penned, um, will you still love me by the Shirelles? I guess it's called, will you love me? But it was made a hit by the Shirelles in 1960. It was the first number one by a black girl group. And she was 18 years old. Carol King was 18 when that song hit number one. Isn't that amazing? It is. And it's just amazing. I love that Shirelles version too. Well, I love the Shirelles. I mean, they're, 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 I, I, they're, all of their songs are fantastic. But yeah, that's amazing. That, that Well, 18. Mm-hmm. To write a song like that. And then, then they wrote a song. Didn't they write a song that they had their babysitter sing? Little Eva, a locomotion. Yes. That was their babysitter. Little Eva was their babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, 18 years old, having a number one hit. And, and I wonder, Tony, what kind of pressure does that put one under? I mean, you're 18 years old and you're hitting number one. It's like, for most people, the only way down, the only way is down. But she just kept climbing, right? Oh, absolutely. And then uh, after they divorced, I mean, obviously went on to to write some unbelievable songs. But uh, yeah, I couldn't believe that that when I saw that. And I, like I mentioned earlier in the episode, I love her remake of that on Tapestry when she mm-hmm. slowed the tempo down. And you know who's uh, cover i had mentioned this to the uh, to you the other day I, i'm yeah. a big amy winehouse fan and uh amy winehouse's version is very much like carol king's around the same tempo slowed down and beautiful yeah that, 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 there was a talented talented vocalist you know mm-hmm. we lost her much much too early yeah. yeah and here is our final uh thing about that we think you should know about carol king is the most successful female songwriter of the second half of the 20th century. And I'm assuming they, you know, because of the rock and roll era, I can't think of, I was just mentioning on break to you. um, I can't think of anybody even in the first half of the 20th century who was as prolific as she was female songwriters, but get this, this stat is astounding. She has written or co-written 118 top 100 hits. Wow. You know, Isn't that something. Well, I mean, 118. You know, how many artists can claim to have written 20 top 10 hits or 20 top 100 hits? I mean, 118. And you think about the artists who covered the music, right? I mean, I, I, I mentioned the Monkees, who did a great song called Pleasant Valley Sunday, which she wrote. And, and other artists who have just, Aretha Franklin, who just tackled her stuff. But even other, like, prog rock bands who would take on Carol King's music and make it their own in the 70s. I mean, they just, uh, she's incredible, incredible writer, incredible. And I think it's only now, and it's sad that, I mean, I'm glad she's in for her songwriting, but she should be in for her career as an artist, period. That's right. So one more time, Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, <laughs> if you are listening, do this now. Uh, like, can you imagine the firestorm of criticism that's going to happen if her and tina turner don't get in okay i'm just shocked they have tina turner is it's 2021 right i mean yeah. seriously mm-hmm. i mean come on and, and you know what aaron this talk of them not being in the rock hall as solo artists is making me a little grumpy actually oh no is it that time it is that yes time. <laughs> your turn <laughs> So, you know, you know, what makes me grumpy is this whole e well, first of all, email, because I know your job and my job, you're, you're talking sometimes hundreds of emails a day. Yes. But folks, please stop hitting reply all to emails. I don't want to know how your hair appointment went or how your aunt Martha's I- muffins tasted or don't hit reply all. And if you're going to thank someone, thank the person who sent the initial email. You don't have to thank 182 people. That's right. And it's driving me bananas. And I have started telling organizations that I'm with as it is, if that starts happening, I'm out. I'm tapping out. I'm giving up. I'm not going to follow it anymore. If you need to reach me, send it directly because I am not going to search through a reply all (laughs) email chain. And you know, the worst, worst part is Aaron is when you look at these reply all chains, a lot of the responses are one or two words. I, I know. <laughs> I, I know. 
<laughs> so that is my grumpy old man moment. My get off my lawn moment. Please stop I'm, using reply all. I'm with you on that. With you on that. Solidarity. Because police folks, there's two reply buttons. One that says reply, one that says reply all. Just take a piece of black electrical tape and tape it over the uh, reply all for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, we should get ready for Six Degrees of Beatlemania, so I'm going to cue up the music, and we'll be right back. All right, Aaron, before we get to the Beatlemania, I'm not sure if it's picking up, but my dog is out there barking, and it's probably picking up on the microphone. I usually edit those out, but I think for this episode, I'm going to leave it in minute. because something out there is catching her attention, and she's oh, barking no. away. <laughs> is it the military? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Toronto, Aaron. It's not Toronto. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. You're in Ottawa. Yeah, yeah. Ottawa, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, hit me with some Beatlemania here. Well, now I could talk about... The fact that they recorded a song called Chains on their first album that was written by Carol King and Jerry Goffin. But I'm going to go in another direction here, folks. Okay. I, I love Tapestry. I love Tapestry. I love Tapestry. However, while I was rating Supreme at number one, it blocked Paul and Linda McCartney's Ram from going to number one. An album that deserved to be number one. It made number one in England, the rest of the world. But in America and Canada, it got blocked by Carol. Now, Carol, I love you. But... Folks, Paul and Linda could have just, you know, had a couple of weeks of number one. You may remember the big hit off of Ram, Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey. Um, so that's my, my Beatle connection is that she kept Paul McCartney from number one in 1971 with her album Tapestry. And poor Paul was stuck at number two for almost the amount of time that she was at number one. <laughs> <laughs> but that gives you some historical perspective of how big that album was. Oh, 100%. 100%. You're not talking about Ram, are you? No, I'm t- well, yeah, of course. Well, both, but, you know, because the anticipation around Ram was huge. And, oh, and- yeah. It was, it was, a, and it, you know what? It's now, it's now recognized as one of the greatest albums. I just read a top 10 in 1971, which, of course, Carol King topped, but Ram, once again, Ram is at number three. But, anyways, at least it's, it's being recognized in 2021 as a, as a great album. But, anyways, that's my Beatle connection that she kept Paul from number one. Yeah, well, that's a good one. Well, you know, poor Paul, he's been blocked by two big albums in his career. One, The other one was in 1978, London Town. Kept it at number one by the then big selling album, Saturday Night Fever. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, Saturday Night Fever was a juggernaut. There was no <laughs> knocking that thing off. <laughs> poor Paul, though, you know, because, gosh, know. He, ne- he never had a chance to write many hits, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> So that's my beetle bowl, but there you go, Tony. Well, the there we go. Yeah. Well, Aaron, as always, uh, what a pleasure it's been talking about Carol oh, King. Yeah. yeah, been fun, eh? I was so glad that we did this episode. And, uh, you know, hopefully the uh, the guys at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame have been listening and, and will take our advice and, and make it happen. And uh, or, or we'll send them a reply all. That's right. <laughs> With one word answers. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, folks, we'd like to thank you for listening, and uh, you can find our podcast anywhere we get podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, you name it, we're on there. You can also support the show if you'd like. Uh, we have a donate button on our website at www.stewytunes.com, and that just always goes to help cover some of the fixed costs of the show. But we are so appreciative of you listening taking the time every week to give up, you know, half an hour or 40 minutes of your time and check out our little show. And we're very grateful. So until we meet again, until we are in your podcast player again, stay safe, be well, and see you next time. Thanks for listening to The Stewie Tune Show. Follow us on social media or visit us online at stewytunes.com. And if you're enjoying the show, don't forget to click subscribe. Hi, this is Tony Stewart, creator and host of The Stewie Tune Show. Aaron and I are thrilled that you have chosen to listen to today's episode. Like all things... 
Putting on this show costs money, and if you'd like to support the podcast with a donation, we'd be grateful. Visit buymeacoffee.com slash stewytunes to learn how you can help cover the fixed costs of putting out this podcast. Again, that website is buymeacoffee.com slash stewytunes. You can also click the support the show button at the bottom of the episode notes. Thanks again for listening to the Stewie Tunes Show.